Okay, um, we're going to have Mark Jelinek give a talk very shortly, but um, 5.30, we're going to start uh, dinner at the Factory Club. For those who don't know where it is, it's right, uh, right there. So it's pretty much on the way back to the dorms. So you probably went up this green hill, and it's just east of the green hill. 5.30? <laughs> you want me to leave it up? Uh, you can take it off now. Everyone got that? And we're recording you. You're recording me? Yeah. For eternity. That's it. Is it on? No. Just for you, I'll give you a private tour, though, Roberta. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to start by antagonizing some students a bit. Um, those of you who know me know that I do this a lot. I gave a talk at Cambridge recently, and I started antagonizing the older faculty, which made the students laugh. Um, antagonize means I just ask lots of questions, but usually directly to you. Uh, so I'm going to talk, <coughs> I'm going to introduce the topic I'm on in a minute, but I'm going to talk about climate mantle coupling, and in particular, how processes in the mantle that happen on 10, 100 billion, to 100 million year, 2 billion year time scales affect Earth's climate, and how we learn about it. And some of the problems we're working on is the question of whether Earth's climate is a, perhaps, I wouldn't say it's the most, but it's certainly among the most restrictive constraints on what the interior of the planet's doing, if you can figure out how this mapping works. But we'll get there. I want to start with a movie, and then <clears throat> the movie is something that Tobias Hoink um, it's made with Adrian, and it's part of a bigger project, which is basically what do continents do to the mantle? And I just have a movie, I'm going to play it first, and then we're going to work through a couple questions. But all the students are in the first three rows. Uh, I'm going to play this, and then I'm going to point this at some folks, and we're going to chat about it. So, <clears throat> you know. So first we'll watch. To Tobias is a great movie maker. I, I'm, I do mostly fluid dynamics experiments, which never look this good. But, so I have experimental envy briefly. Okay, so we're looking at a billion years of simulation time. No, well, not really. A billion years of, uh, <coughs> of time represented by a much shorter period of Tobias's life than a billion years. And what you're looking at is continents moving around at the surface. They're being drawn around as a result of blue downwellings and red upwellings. Uh, so we've got plates, plumes, and continents. Um, <coughs> fuzzy stuff on the right. It's fuzzy stuff. No, that's uh, Tobias's plate breaking up. So these are real plates. These are real plates. So if if Shiji wasn't in the room, I would say real plates because they're real enough. Uh, but he hates this sort of approach to doing plates. Um, but these are continents that are buoyant or strong; they break. So you're looking at the formation and breakup of continents in a fairly simplified model. Now the model's aimed at exploring several things. One is what does an insulating continent do to, to, to the mantle? Um, what happens when they run into each other? And what's the response of uh, 
the underlying mantle um, to, to those changes. Okay, so uh, I got one question aimed at me, so you're free for the, for, for the next nanosecond. Um, if you guys uh, had five seconds to make one observation to a drunk guy in a bar about what that flow looked like, what would you say? I'll even play it again while you have your five seconds. Because <clears throat> that'll give you ten seconds. So one observation, either of the plates or the temperature field, let's say. One observation. Okay, plumes shooting up. They're shooting up continually, episodically. They move. Okay, they move and they dance. It's jerky. Okay, so, <clears throat> so if you were to describe the stirring here, it's jerky. All right, so one of the things we learned just by looking at the simulation we include plates is that the, the stirring itself is time dependent. Right, it's jerky, wanders around. Plates wander around, they slam into each other. In this case, they form a supercontinent for a while. That eventually, if we kept going, it would break up into smaller bits, which would wander around again until they run into, run into each other again. Um, <clears throat> So the flow is inherently time dependent when we start adding plates. Um, what else can we say? I'll just make a, uh, a strong statement. Um, and then, again, I'm going to ask some students to comment on it. So the formation and breakup of supercontinents imparts thermal transients that govern climate over long time scales. Right? Is that obvious? First, what's a thermal transient? Okay, a hot thing that moves from one spot, maybe a plume, to, one spot to, another. to another. Okay, how about fewer words? Okay, we'll, we'll stay with hot. How about fewer words? <laughs> That's it. It'd be good, though. I could vaporize faculty. <coughs> All right, any other ideas? What's a transient? Okay, changes through time. We have this jerky stirring. We have this insulating continent perhaps helping to cause this jerky stirring, or it's certainly involved in the process. But abrupt. But abrupt. Abrupt compared to what? Compared to time. <laughs> it's abrupt compared to time. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> it's jerky. Every time the continents move, we move this insulator around. The mantle is trying to figure out what to do with that footprint. Um, now, on Monday, I think we had a little discussion about potential temperature. At least it was introduced. So in this jerky, stir jerky weird flow, what's the potential temperature in the mantle? Now people are looking down. So, <laughs> woman with a hat. <laughs> You're the only one with a hat. You're stuck with that. <laughs> How do we choose a potential temperature in a flow that's jerky? So if I didn't show you this movie, what would the potential temperature of the mantle be? It's 80 bat. How many 80 bats are in a jerky flow? One? Many? 14? Okay, there's at least one beneath the continent that you choose, one, one you know, away from the continent. Choose a different mantle. You might, might be on a different adiabat. Um, so the other issue that enters into the mantle heat transfer problem or convection problem and how it's expressed at the surface in climate or volcanism or whatever is how well stirred the mantle is over what time scales it's stirred. Um, when you choose an adiabat, you look up 1350 in your geodynamics class. If I show you this and tell you it's a billion years, you know that, well, less, you know, if we don't stir the earth an awful lot of times, that single adiabat doesn't have a lot of meaning. But to understand volcanism and outgassing and climate uh, at the surface and if we go into Bruce's world, what's happening at the bottom of the mantle and what it does to the core, um, understanding the evolution of mantle internal te interior temperature and how it changes in space and in time is crucial. Um, it's jerky. It's not well stirred, at least on 100 million year time scales. It might be well stirred on very long time scales. Uh, okay, we had some hints. Come back to Kent's talk. <clears throat> so this is a uh, figure that we basically saw with different authors. Uh, 
It's a zircon age record, and we've learned, if anything, it's, um, it's not crustal production necessarily. It's, I think I would just say, episodic stuff, where that stuff is involved in granite production, tectonic uplift, weathering. Um, in the discussions we had today and on Monday, there was a bit of talk about bias, how you link zircons which grow in granite to crustal production, um, <clears throat> how you go about understanding that. What you can look at here is even if you don't know the origin or even you don't know what the, what's causing the signal, whether it's weathering, whether it's orogenesis, whether it's the production of granites, what you do see is that the periodicity here is on long time scales, right? sort of 500 million year to billion year time scales. And so there's probably a mantle influence in that. It correlates with some of the supercontinents, so perhaps continents are involved. But the main point here is that if these things are related to crustal production or related to granite production or related to uplift, um, perhaps they're hints about the time dependence and what the mantle is doing. Down the bottom, if you like orogenesis, this is the same idea expressed in the green, blue, and red are spikes in the, in the I would say, well, in the amount of gold at a certain age, biased to where you look for gold. So the, the record there is biased towards uh, the U.S., Siberia, and South Africa. Um, <clears throat> there are other hints of this time dependence. Um, Shiji's worked a lot on this in writing papers about Earth's inherent love affair with degree one mantle convection, um, which is to say that you end up there every now and then. Uh, <clears throat> and Shiji's argued that the production of supercontinents is partly related to the fact that the degree one mantle convection is uh, sort of where, where things end up. The bottom plot is interesting. See that the formation and breakup of supercontinents is sort of lagged a bit by these big bursts of plumes. All right, so even if you don't buy the zircon record as being related obviously to crustal production or anything uh, that is a straightforward link to the mantle, um, we have supercontinents and we have these sort of plume events that also show up in bursts that are also episodic with Shiji, how did you guys make that histogram? So here it's easy. So we actually look at surface area, look at the number density of plumes, but how'd you guys get those histograms? Ah, that's that guy. <laughs> yes. Well, I, you know, I, I edited the paper. <laughs> Kent. They're gone? So we have a data transients. You know, I was the editor who handled that paper, so we have an editorial transient. I didn't do my job. Yeah. Okay, but so the early ones, probably not, but certainly, uh, I wouldn't say certainly, but the, uh, the bursts following Rodinia and Pangaea are certainly not surprising. We're going to look at the Pangaea data in greater detail in a moment. But the point here is that we've got some indicators that stirring is jerky, complicated. <clears throat> um, if we look at an experiment, an, Earth exper an experiment Earth's done for us in a little more detail, um, we can get a few more observations into the mix, trying to figure out what the mantle's doing and then how, the mantle, how that's expressed at the surface among other things. So this is Pangaea. Uh, I think I stole this from Torsten's website. Um, no. I didn't? I thought I did. did, but I don't, did you steal it from somebody and I took it from your website? So. I think so. OK. Well, anyway, um, it is what it is. This is the Pangaea formation about 300 million years ago, and it breaks up. Uh, <clears throat> looking at the timeline, so it forms up here. Uh, the sort of red area is the time of which the, the, the supercontinent actually forms. At about 150 or 170, therefore, it's, things start to break up. And a number of things happen. So one is this light up of large igneous provinces. Uh, if you look down here, this is the magnetic field history. We go from a high reversal frequency, in fact, about a factor of two bigger than we have now, to a couple of periods that are part of what's called a Cretaceous long normal, no reversals. Uh, so <clears throat> Whatever's going on in the interior of the mantle is expressing itself in the magnetic field. If you look up at the temperature record, at least as far back here, because um, maybe Lou can explain how the data works that way, because I don't understand Pfizer's curve beyond that. 
Um, the part of the story I want to focus on today is, is whether uh, <clears throat> this cooling period during formation followed by nearly 100 million years of greenhouse, um, how that emerges from a supercontinental cycle. And the bigger problem that we don't have, I don't have time to get into, certainly in this lecture, the more interesting one, is how this signal relates to mantle convection, uh, relates to supercontinental formation and breakup, um, how that relates to the supercontinental problem, and in turn to what's going on in the dynamo. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, since, I mean, in Pangaea time, I would say that I mean, you always have a preservation issue, but in the last 300 million years, it's probably not a huge deal. There's a massive increase here compared to here. Um, usually with preservation problems, you see an exponential decline. But how many of the flips do you see? Uh, how many are on there? So... Uh, Untong Java is the big one. Yeah. Um, Kent, I mean, do you have an opinion about the? For me, this this burst is fun to play with theoretically. So, yeah. Well, then it's not so much. So the young ones have been sampled. It's a question, you know, do you believe in this burst of LIPs compared to here? So if you were to say, you know, the frequency of LIP volcanism climbs as we go through the break of the Pangaea and thereafter. Would you be happy with that? No. No. I think the data needs to be looked at a lot more carefully. There are a couple of, a couple of things, right? There are, I guess, all the, you know, the sea floor, the oldest sea floor is 180. So yeah. some of the, you know. Yeah, so we're missing that data set. You know, probably missing some of that. And also, actually, I'm kind of curious. Uh, that sea level fall, I think this Cretaceous sea level rise, right? Oh, yeah, those are reversed. <laughs> yeah, that's a PowerPoint problem. Yes. So, yes. Uh, I'm curious how you get sea level and temperature before you have life. I mean, what is that the temperature of that delta T? Uh, so, I mean, Visor's record is based on delta 18 measurements, where everywhere it's cold, he's assuming there's polar ice. And Oh, I don't know. I don't. So that's why I was hoping Lou was here, but He's here. he is here. So Lou, so from Gondwana back, why is? I mean, I've never understood Visor's curve back that far. So, Which curve? so this is Visor's delta eighteen curve. He turned into temperature. Uh, and yeah, I don't think it's right. I mean, we're not, I think it's, a, it's not that it's right. I think that I think that those samples are altered, and that the eighteen no. record in carbonates going that far back is not good. Yeah. The whole, I mean, the whole of it, or just the... No, no, the older part, where you get these very yeah. light 18s and you infer these high temperatures, right? Yeah. I mean, the point so, is that you have life to get fractionation of carbonate, so you can have these fractions, it's just that they're altered. Yeah. So I think, I mean, this, I don't think that this 100 million year period of greenhouse is that contentious. I think the one before it certainly is. Um, but the interesting thing climatically is you have 100 million years of a few degrees above normal, um, well... It's that it's there for 100 million years, right? So it's a mantle convection time scale, and that's the I mean that's the interesting thing. Um, <clears throat> the question that uh, a few of us I'll introduce in a minute have been thinking about is: Is this an archetypal footprint of supercontinental cycles? So what's the footprint? Uh, cooling, warming, um, change in sea level, though I've these reversed, uh, and the light up of large igneous provinces. Uh, occurring during breakup. Um, <clears throat> and mantle dynamically, the question for us is, does the formation and breakup of the supercontinent plus these guys, does the change in the heat transfer properties of the mantle plus LIPs give rise to that greenhouse preceded by the cooling trend? Now, where this problem gets interesting is the other experiment we can do, meaning that we have data, is uh, Rodinia. Which is about the same time we expect we get a super greenhouse at the same time in the, in, the form, in the breakup cycle. The end of Rodinia, we go through a global glaciation. 
So here we're four or five degrees, or four degrees or so above present day. To get a snowball instability, we have to be about all five or six degrees less than normal at least. Um, right, so here's where the problem becomes interesting. If supercontinents have the same effect on the mantle, meaning that you basically take a form of frisbee of continent, and I'll walk through what it does to the mantle, and perturbs it to form a greenhouse here, how did the same sort of setup produce a snowball earth? And that's where I'm going to go with the talk. Um, <clears throat> these kinds of problems uh, I describe as a cider-esque journey. Why is that? Well, the cast of characters involved is an interesting mix. You've got Adrian and I, two vagrants, a paleoceanographer who mostly tells me I'm wrong most of the time so, to like, learn, an atmospheric physicist, an aerosol chemist, and we even picked up Cinti Lee to make sure the story stays um, particularly twisted. <laughs> <clears throat> but the problem basically is a simple one, which is how do super, supercontinents alternately form, lead to a greenhouse and an ice and a snowball state? How do we do that? How does the Earth do that? Okay, now let's learn a little bit about, I mean, they're, they're, they're not exactly the same problem. So the mantle dynamic problem, I'm going to argue, is probably not that different. But what the, uh, the world in which those supercontinents were forming and breaking are potentially quite, are, are quite different. So if we look at this first curve, which is oxygen, the first thing is that, well, Pangaea's world isn't that different to our own. Uh, if you look over here, which is um, a popular comic for the ocean, we've got a high oxygen world and a well-mixed and a well-mixed ocean full of life. If we go back towards Rodinia, um, the oxygen level is sort of around 1% of now, could be even less than that. Uh, the oceans themselves are thought to be, well, potentially complicated. Oxidized layer on top, an anoxic bottom ocean. If you look at this curve from Nick Butterfield, which is, basically, which is a history of life, the main thing that changes is we go from single cell world, lots of little guys, to eukaryotes through the snowball event to basically life as we know it now. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, in, ter in terms of a climate problem, the Earth system, we go from uh, a low oxygen, complicated ocean, small guy world, to a very uh, oxidized, mixed ocean world full of very complicated biology. All right, so even if, <clears throat> and one of the questions out of the gate is, even if the mantle is doing its thing, doing its thing the same way in both places, in both, at both epochs in Earth history. Uh, does the way in which the surface of the Earth respond to what the mantle does? Is that the same? And we're going to sort of walk through that, but I'm going to start in the mantle. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> um, Adrian and I have done a lot of work on what continents do. And I'm going to summarize some work, very quickly, some work that we published a couple of years ago, which basically zooms in on part of that video I showed you at the start. Um, <clears throat> and it basically zooms in at the supercontinent itself. And we're going to do an experiment. So I'm going to start with a well-mixed mantle where the potential temperature is roughly one number. Uh, introduce a supercontinent to it. And if we zoomed in on that video a bit, um, one of the things that happens when you form up a supercontinent is that the continental pieces are drawn together, initially surrounded by island arcs, is as soon as you introduce subduction around the sides of these things, you have a curtain of cold slabs that now get in the way of mantle, mix, of mantle motions taking mantle from here, warm mantle from beneath the continent, and putting it over here. So we start introducing that jerkiness. Um, and then, uh, well, what happens when we let go of the jerkiness, when the continent breaks up? I'll show you um, a sort of uh, a couple of pictures about that. Okay, now let's try some intuition. All right, back to the laser pointer. All right, here I said there's one potential temperature. Um, I found the woman with a hat, green shirt. All right. Um, in this case, you know, <clears throat> this is one of Adrian's sketches. It's a big red spot, so you know it's warm. Um, so I want to ask you that question. 
is that warm? I, I know the answer to that one. Uh, if this is getting warm, what's happening over here? Okay, it's cooling a bit. Now, I'll tell you that the time between here and here is relatively fast, tens of millions of years. So a little colder, a little warmer. If it's a little colder over here, what does the subduction rate do, or what does the spreading rate do? Slow down. Why? That's OK. How about uh, Ben? I realize you've transcended. I well, know you haven't graduated yet. I can actually pick on you as a student. <coughs> Maybe you won't graduate if you get the question wrong. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we said we've, we've gone from it got colder and it's going to slow down to a lot of words that said mostly the same thing. So, okay, so why is it slowing down? Michael, Michael can barely contain himself. What? <laughs> so why is it slowing down? Oh. Okay, that may be a con- that may be a consequence if it's slowing down. But why is it slowing down in the first place? Okay, stickier mantle. Um, if we slow down the overturn rate, a couple things can happen. One is the temperature here drops a bit, as we said initially. Upwelling rates go down if we've slowed down the, the overturn. So crustal mid-ocean ridge, crustal production can go down. In fact, it, you know, we can actually get it to go almost to zero. Um, arcs are a little more complicated, but to the extent to which they're controlled by subduction rate, um, they expect to decline a bit as well. <clears throat> okay, then we're going to walk through the, tra- the, the next parts a little bit more. Mark, yeah. Mark, I have a question. Why is it colder and why is it slowing down? You've got longer <laughs> plates. If subduction is driven by plate, or, or, uh, plate tectonics is driven by plate subduction, you've got long, old oceanic plates that can be moving fast. Uh, so, well, t- I mean... It's, it's not clear to me that it's either colder or it's So, in the mo- in the model in, in in the model problem, which you can already argue is a total nightmare, if you'd like to. Well, I think one of the problems is the scale there. Um, those subduction zones are big. And the supercontinent would be a lot wider than you showed it. They'd be a lot further towards the edge. Of I mean, this is a cartoon that Adrian drew just to show the, the principle. But, but three quarters of the Earth is still ocean. Three quarters of the Earth is ocean. But if we reduce the te- if we reduce the, me- the temperature of the ocean mantle of f- a few degrees, we make it a bit more viscous. All right, the driving. F- why do you do that? Yeah, the question is why. It's, it's the whole mantle convection scheme, and it's cleaner. Right? Why does you don't have all these continents uh, in the way of, of a whole mantle convection scheme? So if we prevent, okay. So the question, I mean, <clears throat> I'm going to sh- I'll show you some simulations and experiments that both look at this. So the question really is, if we prevent the lateral, the lateral uh, transfer of warm stuff from beneath the continent into the ocean, right? So, if we change, so right now, the average potential temperature of the Earth depends on how much continental insulation you have. Right? But if, we, if now we short-circuit the ability of that warm mantle to be mixed around, then the ocean gets a bit colder. That's the... Michael. Mark, I think I have a simpler question. Yeah. And then in some short time period, which you call tens of millions of years, underneath the continent becomes warmer. Where is that heat coming from? Uh, can I get to? Can I move away from the cartoon? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not so. Uh, it's not that the heat is. Where does the heat come from? This is heating up on an advective time. So I'm not generating the heat. I mean, the heat's not being generated locally. We're just not taking the, heat, the, the stuff here and moving it sideways. So the times, if I give you a time scale of 100 million years and we talk about a longer scale length, then perhaps it makes more sense. Can I go to the... Can I get out of the cartoon before we... <laughs> okay. Uh, I can see... 
We may or may not get to the actual climate part. <clears throat> okay, so the experiment is as follows. Um, this is one of Adrian's simulations, and we do the same thing in lab experiments. So the beginning and the end, we have, a, uh, in a time average sense, a well-mixed mantle um, with one potential temperature. Introduce a supercontinent to this problem. And this one, this simulation and the experiment I'm going to show you in a minute is extreme. But introduce a supercontinental perturbation. And by extreme, I mean that we sit there and we do the experiment in the simulation until the slab gets all the way to the bottom and forms a perfect curtain that prevents communication from the warm side to the cold side. Uh, in reality, it's unlikely that that curtain is ever, I mean, it doesn't have enough time for one to produce a curtain that does, that's that strong. Um, but I'm going to talk about how we constrain from observations how much thermal unmixing, which is what I would call this, or Adrian has called it, we would get. So Mark, is the heat just coming in the bottom? Is that part it's getting hot? It's not going out the top? It's not going yes. It's, it's going out the top slowly beneath the continent and being stirred in from the bottom. Um, but you get the same results without bottom heating as well, just by having insulation there. Yeah, but it's, so over 150 million years, you can do a calculation. You steal from the top, like the zero heat, the heat bottom, escape, and you capture some regenerative heat that most people would prefer, and you can do a calculation. The heating will do more than 20 degrees. From radiogenic, from radiogenic heating. From radiogenic heating. So this is advective heating. Adrian, do you want to jump in here? Still, yeah, you're still stirring. You're just not remo you're not at, you're not taking the the warm mantle from beneath the continent and moving it sideways. Do you have a distant difference in temperature? Do you expect more flow of salts under on a supercontinent? Um, As opposed to, can you wait? If I can show you. I mean, we, I can, if you can wait two slides, if we get there, <laughs> or even one slide. Uh, if you really have these extreme it's, it's, a dumb question. it's not a dumb question. So, the um, I mean, if I get to the observations that constrain what, how much lateral temperature difference was possible in Pangaea, uh, the petrology suggests 150 degrees. Um, so if we, if we do this experiment, we run a lab experiment, which I'll show you in the next slide, and we get the biggest possible steady state temperature difference. It can be you know, 40% of the temperature drop across the whole system. Um, but that, takes, that would take a billion years, for one. Um, <clears throat> right, so the, let me get to the observation, then I can answer that. So, Shiji, the point is we're just messing up the stirring. Right? I'm not... I'm not sure how much extra... Right, the only way we can constrain how much we're messing up for Pangaea is with other observations that I haven't even got to, I haven't got to yet. So in an experiment or in a box and in Tobias' sphere, we can get this behavior. Can I just add one thing, Mark, yeah. that might help? The argument is not that you slap the continent on. The argument that this relies on is when continents are there, the mantle is always running higher. Yes. Always. Yes. Most times that heat is stirred through the entire mantle, that insulation effect. Now you're cutting it off. So there is no new heat source. No, no, it's there. Adrian, how do you want to? So that, that is, there's bottom and mixed heating, but it's. But we, imagine if you, um, let's say you take that situation and you're okay with it, right? Then you collapse that subduction curtain. Yeah. Okay, and then everything mixes together and you have some well mixed temperature. Now go the reverse, you cut it off, and that insulating effect, because the lithosphere is forced to be thicker under the continent, mm -hmm. that is an assumption that the chemical layer is going to be thicker. 
productive layer. Then you go that other direction. So where it's coming from is that you're not mixing in the heat that would be under the, the insulating domain. That's 40% of the temperature drop. Well, this is a steady, this is if we run at the steady state forever, right? This is not what we expect for Pangea. And yeah, that comes back to the, Mark's going to get to the time scale issue. This was actually run to get the other steady state. Right. Really so this, <coughs> uh, Would this also be near the end of the supercontinent cycle? Because if you have a colder oceanic mantle where you don't have your supercontinent, wouldn't you get a lot quicker spreading at the onset to release the heat? Yes. That would slow down. Yeah, in fact, that's what, so, yes, let me walk through it, though. So, this, <clears throat> if we let this thing go to steady state, do it in a lab experiment, it takes forever to get here. Massive temperature differences. This is not, sta this is not gravitationally stable. Right? There's, different, there's lateral differences in hydrostatic pressure. They want to make this go up there and this go down there. Uh, if you let it run, <clears throat> let that happen either in an experiment. So this is a lab experiment which has a lid here and or a, a insulating lid here and a laboratory equivalent of a subducting slab um, that is here separating these two regions. If we remove the lid in a lab experiment, what you see is the warm stuff rising and the cold stuff sinking. Um, and that's what's happening from here to here. In the numerical <coughs> simulation, same thing. So in this case, the curtain goes unstable, and the stuff rises up, and we've got warm stuff, and you expect very, very rapid melting initially, big burst. Um, and then eventually the system sort of figures itself out. Um, okay. So, Bruce, you okay? Or, I mean, all, so all we're doing is we're having a, uh, all we're doing is messing with the stirring in the mantle. And depending on how much we mess with the lateral transfer of stuff from continental side, from underneath continents to the ocean, we can produce lateral temperature variations. How big those are depends on how, how good the mixing inefficiency is, so to speak, how much we turn that off. Yeah, I guess that's the question is how big is this effect? Yeah, and so for that we have to, yeah, so for that, I mean, I've got, we've got, for Pangea, there are some observations that constrain that to a degree until the petrologists in the room say, Oh, sorry. Oh, it does at the end. So, so what's happening here is basically your experiment starts here. We get into that perfectly isolated, unmixed regime that offended most everyone in the room. And then we release that gravitational potential energy. And what you're seeing is the warm gravity current rising up and increasing. This is just the temperature on the ocean side, rising up and making the ocean warmer, uh, and then the system recovering. The other parts, which I skipped over, in the laboratory experiments, you can see a little clearer than in the simulations. As the cold stuff, cold stuff from the gravity from the, the ocean side spreads out, you can see in experiments, is the emergence of large plumes. So sometime later, LIPs are expected to erupt, at least, in, at least in the model. So we mess up, we do the experiment, we have a mixed mantle, we mess up the lateral stirring and make it a bit colder until breakup happens or the, or the mantle overturns on its own because it's unstable. And then we go through this evolution that is characterized by the arrival of plumes much later. Uh, yeah. We're going to look at it. So can, can you? Okay. <laughs> can you? I want to get out of model world, and then I want to get into the observations, because there are. I mean, there are constraints that that you will have to argue with yourself. <laughs> So in the model, can we get to the Pangean curtain? <laughs> I mean, there is exactly one, one set of observations that, uh, you know, if you believe the petrology, um, gives a constraint on what lateral temperature variations were possible. So you may have curtains left over, but if they're not efficient at, at, at messing up the lateral mixing, then it doesn't matter, 
Right? The issue here is how ineffective was convective mixing during the breakup of Pangaea, or before, during the formation of Pangaea. So do we make a curtain, or do we make a blanket with lots of holes in it, for example? OK, a couple of predictions uh, from this model that, <coughs> um, that we're playing with. We have a basic state, thermally well-mixed mantle with one temperature. We let supercontinents come together. So as Adrian said, we're not s just sticking them on there. Um, in Pangean world and in Rodinia, we're looking at a time scale of sort of 150 million years is what we have for, for the unmixing. So how much happens during that? We don't know that. Um, in the models, we, this process produces a relatively cold ocean and a relatively warm subcontinental mantle. It's effects on spreading rate. And then we walk through this sort of transient um, a little bit, the most interesting part of which is a late arrival of plumes. Now, to uh, let's see where this goes with Shiji. <clears throat> so how, well, how thermally unmixed was the Pangean mantle? Well, we've got one data set. That's it. All right, so <clears throat> uh, Kellerman and Holbrook, actually following a lot of work by Steve Holbrook in the Atlantic, um, mapped out the East Coast Magmatic Province, which is basically delineated by the East Coast Magnetic Anomalies, this red thing. It's a long, skinny guy. And the interesting parts of it are, there's two interesting observations. One, the intrusion is parallel with the mid-ocean ridge. That's not that interesting yet. It looks like crustal production. The part that got them excited is over here. The part that got them excited is the overthickened crust with high seismic velocities. And then Peter Kellerman in, in, in uh, his 95 paper, which was reproduced mostly in Brandel's paper a month ago, um, argued that the, best, the, most, the, the most straightforward way to produce the seismic velocities is with high magnesium melts that happen at about 2 GPA. So what these guys were arguing was basically that um, these melts were produced they required the, the subcontinental mantle to be about 150 degrees hotter than normal mantle to make. Um, and they were produced at 60 or so kilometers, um, pretty far down. Now, Baraj <clears throat> uh, may have something to say about whether this is realistic. But there, so the sodium numbers for here, sodium 8 is about 2, 2.3 for um, these magmas. But anyway, geometrically, <clears throat> it's parallel with the mid-ocean ridge. It's only about 80 kilometers wide, so it's one event. 1,000 kilometers long without a lot of change in this thickness. So we produce a lot of crust with lots of magnesium. Um, and these guys infer about 150 degrees lateral temperature variations. Same thing that Brandel showed in Nature Geoscience a month ago or so. Um, so that's it, Shiji. I mean, that's, that's from petrology. There's more from heat flow and, and plate velocity from Torsten. Uh, I agree, but what, so, okay, let's, so let's go look at the petrologists in the room. Gigi says that the, the petrologic model, these are olivine rich, high magnesium basalts formed at 2 GPA or so, is not a good constraint, that that 150 degree temperature difference is, is not believable. Um, and then the spatial correlate, I mean, it's the, 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 I think the aspect ratio is what attracted Peter Kellerman to it. So petrologically, is, are these guys nuts? Is this based just on the remote imaging of what's underneath that pile of sediments, or is it, what about the actual lavas on land that are the same age, more or less? Uh, well, so the pre, I mean, so these were erupted over a long time. I mean, the, the, the volcanics that are associated with these are pickrites. So they're hot, right? Uh, but I mean, is that, up, uh, is the abstract that they're pickrites, is that, Yes. No, no. It's looking at rocks. It's looking at the rocks on the land. Okay. And they did a lot of, you know, uh, ex well, petrologic experiments to convince themselves that this is the intrusive equivalent. Um, so the problem, I mean, so Shiji says dynamic topography would be insane. We'd have the Himalayas next to here. Um, but we've got overthickened crust that and apparently hot melts. Um, 
and a geometry of the intrusion that is basically parallel to the mid-ocean ridge. All right, so these guys had a picture that basically were looking at magmas produced during rifting. Now, in terms of our picture, you know, are we, the question is, are we looking at magmas that are produced during that transient? So are we seeing the warm mantle beneath from the continent move up towards the mid-ocean ridge? So that's a lot. I mean, yeah. we answer, we have to raise some questions a bit of it. I mean, do you really need this 150 uh, degrees Celsius hot, uh, uh, hotter mantle? No. The whole mantle below the continent or just below the layer? Like maybe only, we, we only talk about the subcontinental, subcategoria, say, uh, mantle over depths of Hundred kilometers, then I think then that might be too I mean, Yeah. No, we don't. So we don't require. I mean, we. This is the only constraint we have, right? And the Atlantic is small, and the Atlantic. I mean, I was going to suggest the plume. Of course, you got that. I don't get the kind of geometry. It's kind of hard to. Well, the problem. So the camp is on top of this, but the problem with the plume is the longevity of the emplacement. I mean, I, that issue is still there. Um, do we need the whole mantle to be this? No. I mean, I, this, yeah. No, no, absolutely not. I could. I mean, it, it could be. I, mean, I, I don't. I don't know that part of the world well enough. So 50 to 100 degree temperature varies? OK. Where does this duration come from? I mean, there's, there's a recent paper by Terry Blackburn that says the camp came out in under 10,000 years. This is in camp. This is Yeah, so camp shows up over top of this. It shows up in the middle. I mean, this is not camp. That's where camp is. OK. Um, I'm going to skip some stuff. And it's because I want to get to, so the, the climate stuff, the climate story I'm going to tell you doesn't, you know, we can have globally averaged temperature differences that could be, you know, tens of degrees and still get a very similar pattern, right? But for Shiji's benefit, that's the only constraint we have on the amount of temperature difference that might have been underneath Pangaea. That's it. Um, that's all. Okay, Rodinia. Uh, So the mantle dynamics, probably not too different. It's a big frisbee that ended up at the equator. Um, and I probably spent a long, a long time torturing myself over this, and I didn't think I should take you through that, because um, it's very unrevealing. I'm going to walk through um, the next part. So the mantle dynamics sets volcanism, which sets outgassing. It also sets sea level, which enters into the climate problem a bit, and uh, the way in which mountains work. But I'm going to um, run through this part relatively quickly and then show you some results. So how do we build a climate mantle coupling model? Uh, how do we do the climate side of the model? So the climate model over long time scales, again, the question is, where did this 100 million year long greenhouse come from? Or in Rodinia's world, where did the uh, order 100 million year-ish period of very cold that enabled snowballs come from? Uh, there's a few parts. So one is... We always, we always begin with a carbon cycle. So one is how much carbon is in the Earth, uh, in the uh, ocean atmosphere system. And we worry about the rate of change being, we need to know something about volcanic outgassing, which comes from uh, mantle dynamics models and our, we can predict that. And then where it comes out, and I think Lou's going to get into this in detail, I'm going to show you some things. And it comes out through silicate weathering and removing dead biology from the upper ocean onto shelves. 
Um, so this guy basically determines how much greenhouse, CO2 greenhouse forcing we have at, at the surface, which can affect climate change. The next part is how much CO2 goes into the ocean versus stays in the atmosphere. And this involves an ocean model. Um, and it's something about temperature, alkalinity, and biology, and so on, to know something about how much CO2 is left there. And then finally, a radiation model, which is uh, given, sun, the, given a solar influx, how much sun is coming in, some understanding of how much CO2 is in the atmosphere as a result of uh, these two processes, weathering and burial, water vapor and temperature, um, what's the steady state surface temperature, right? which is what we call climate. Okay, some of the issues that enter, because you're going hit, to get hit with these, a lot of these during CIDR, and I'll summarize them differently in a minute. On the mantle side, how well is the mantle mixed? How, does it, how do volcanoes erupt? What do they put into the atmosphere and at what rate? And where do they do it? Um, sea level change. Dynamic topography. So do we produce or remove shelf area where biology can die? Right, this is a key thing for understanding where, how carbon gets out of the system. How does the Earth's system respond? Well, tectonics enters into the problem, tectonic regime. Do we have mountains? Are we building mountains? Do we have a rainy world or a dry world? How is weathering actually happening? Right, so how is mechanical weathering acting to take crystal minerals, break them down, and, re and so they can be reactive with groundwater to take CO2 out of the atmosphere? What's being weathered? Granites and basalts behave differently and have different effects on the... Uh, temperature at the surface, what's the ocean like, the atmosphere, etc. So there's a lot in it. And um, don't worry, Roberta, I'm not going to walk through it. Um, I am going to walk through just about a couple of things that are interesting. Just when, does, when do various things enter and go away in terms of that problem? So this is the mantle experiment where I've taken the, again, this is the constraint from that uh, Kellerman Holbrook paper that Shiji hates as an upper bound. But the pattern is the point. Um, during formation, um, the expectation is that the supercontinent will be surrounded by island arcs. Not a lot of mountain building. So you're not building topography. So the way in which mechanical and chemical weathering happens is, um, well, uh, more like the Scottish Highlands than it is the Himalayas you know, in an asymptotic limit. Not a lot of rain during its supercontinent. In fact, it's very, very little rain. Um, sea level falls, not a little shelf area to put biology. Uh, there's more granite than there is basalt, which tends to um, resist weathering pretty well. Chemical weathering rate in this regime is thought to, is from geomorphic data and some models. It's proportional to mechanical erosion rate. We go through this transient and start to break up the continent. So the continent rolls over the top of its subduction zones go into mountain building, high rainfall, high shelf area, uh, pick up the salt from large igneous provinces, and then weathering picks up an explicit dependence on subduction rate because we're making mountains, um, which I will not have time to get into. Yeah, yeah, I'm just going to jump to the... There hasn't been any discussion so far, so... Okay. Um, so just to look at the fluxes, what goes in, and then we're going to look at what comes out through just the, the result of it. Um, so this is all reference to the current world. So this is the total CO2 that comes out of volcanoes at the moment. And these are the various contributions. Uh, so mid-ocean ridge basalt, arcs, LIPs, and so on. Um, you can see the basic pattern that we see in the mantle is expressed in volcanism. Right? This, is the linked, this is the link between the two. I want to show you one surprise, and then I'm going to go to the results. Um, <clears throat> So as we go down into the pre, the, the, form, the full formation mode, um, if we drop the oceanic mantle temperature 50 degrees. Sorry, Mark, where did the, those curves come from? Yeah. From the temperature. From the mantle temperature, well, two things. The mantle temperature and the spreading rate, which I normalize to your work. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We can come back. Why don't we, if you have, if you have specific issues, let's come back because I want to get somewhere with this. Okay. Uh, so, yes, the fact that the change in spreading rate is normalized to Torsten's 2009 paper, which I glossed over. But I want to talk about some surprises. In chasing down Rodinia and why it froze, we, we got 
um, we learn something new, which is that as we go into the formation mode, so this is when the ocean, oceanic mantle temperature is as cold as it can be, uh, the expectation is for a lot more of this mid-ocean ridge system to go into a regime that's like the far north Atlantic. And what that is, for those of you who don't spend all our time looking at the far north Atlantic north of Iceland, which is exactly nobody, um, is mid-ocean ridges that produce no crust. Right? So there's no crustal production. The mantle doesn't melt very much underneath it. So that's not spreading. It's just that mantle convection is exposing mantle rocks to the surface, to, to the ocean. And, these, and, and the result of that is pretty interesting. If you, if you do an experiment, I mean, it's really interesting if you let basalt crustal production globally approach zero. The key thing is that mantle rocks and seawater don't get along very well, and they serpentinize, and that releases hydrogen, which reacts with dissolved organic car in, inorganic carbon to make methane. Okay, now if I take the whole mid-ocean ridge system and I turn off crustal production as a thought experiment, and to replace all the CO2 with methane, what happens? Gray. It gets warmer. Who said warmer? Faculty can raise their hands too. Who thinks warmer? Faculty know when they're being set up is the thing, right? <laughs> okay. Um, if the methane gets out of the ocean uh, and goes to the atmosphere, it can do some interesting things. A little methane does make it warmer. Reasons I'm going to talk, I'll get into brief, very briefly. Um, in an oxidized ocean, it won't. The deep water horizon experiment, if you view it positively, uh, did the experiment for it. So the oxidation of oil was supposed to release tons of methane, and we were supposed to do a Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum experiment. The problem is no methane left the ocean. It gets eaten. Uh, all of it got eaten. In a low oxygen world, it's a different world. Uh, in fact, a lot of it can get out. And I asked an aerosol chemist when I started my sabbatical, well, what, is the, what happens if we put, if we make the methane CO2 ratio, let's say about 10% or 20%, it's sort of the lower bound of what, what's possible from this. And the surprise was the production of aerosol. The expectation was to produce methane aerosol. Is anyone interested in Titan in this room? Anyone heard of Titan? Right, so Titan's climate got, got the attention of a lot of folks because there's a ton of methane aerosol in the atmosphere. Methane aerosol looks like this, um, unless it doesn't. Sometimes it looks fractal, which means dendritic. And it absorbs at all wavelengths, which means you put it in the atmosphere, no sunlight will get to the surface. It's one of the reasons Titan is so cold. We expected this because calculations done in very simple atmospheric compositions predicted it. What we got was something very different. What we got was a nitrate aerosol, which now has my, my atmospheric colleagues up in arms. So methane looks like this, aerosol looks like this. What we're getting is a mixture of the two. How that plays out radiatively in terms of the surface is perhaps 20 watts per meter square cooling. A lot. That's three or four degrees. Uh, could even be more. And I'll show you how that plays out in just a minute um, and why that doesn't help at all. Okay, so I'm going to jump all the cool stuff I was planning to show you and look at the results. Okay. Um, the top curve, and in both of these, we're just going to look at um, the blue curve. So the red, so what you're looking at is a predicted temperature change through this cycle. I've reversed it, so now we're looking back in time a million years ago. Um, the blue curve is what happens when I have no dependence uh, of, of chemical weathering on orogenesis. The red curve is what happens when I include mountain building effects based on what geomorphologists think um, or how they think compressive margins work. Um, so this is the end, basically this is the input from outgassing and this is the climate change that results. Now if we compare this, the dashed line is the part of visors temperature data um, that Lou does believe. And Shiji, this, so this is, again I've just taken Holbrook's, Kellerman Holbrook's ideas, let them play out. And I haven't tuned this to match this, but you can see that the basic pattern of cooling, warming, and at least cooling to here is not that crazy, even if you hate the model. Right? The model makes some predictions, which you can't lie about, and this is one of them. Um, interesting. 
Do we understand it completely? No, but it's a model. If we turn to um, rodinia, uh, when I found the nitrate, um, I was bouncing up, around, up and down in Sarah Horst's office because I'd never done an aerosol experiment before, and applied it to this model. What you see is pre-breakup, you can get really cold. In fact, this is conservative. It's very easy to put the Earth into a snowball instability right here. What's the problem? Snowball Earth happened here. <laughs> right, so a model that does OK, at least, to getting the general trend in temperatures for Pangaea, and predicts the greenhouse, predicts its longevity, says that, well, even though Snowball Earth probably happened, at least the data is pretty good, it's pretty much the least probable time, in, uh, at least in our models. Like our model would put Snowball Earth here. Um, we're only off by 100 million years. Right? So if I was an astrophysicist, I'd get excited. Um, <clears throat> and so there's something fundamentally different between these two worlds, but probably mantle dynamically um, because the snowball lasted a long time. Okay, so this is what we're trying to make sense of. I was hoping to make sense of both. I get a snowball 100 million years too early, so this is where we are. And... Uh, Thanks. So uh, we have time for a few questions. I, I have a Kenji of breakup question. It, it looked like you showed really fast a plate reconstruction. I didn't talk about it because I think it's kind of so fast. But I mean, where, where was this slab before the Kenji of breakup? We don't know. It, it's not, um, we don't, I mean, Shiji would be better able to respond to what is the distribution of slabs because he has the reconstructions. How those slabs added up to, met, to mess up mantle stirring. So which parts of those slabs was the most robust to lateral motions? No idea. But Shiji may have comments on where the strongest slabs are versus weakest or It's Cotese's. And, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's at least two different groups that have the subduction zones in the same place. So, it, but the, I mean, the question is if you've got. Yeah. And we don't, I mean, if we knew the age of the slab all the way around, we could say something about which curtain was stronger or weaker, but we don't really know that. Well, maybe Shiji could back it out. Yeah, Torsen. Uh, a little bit more than that, but yeah. Ah, okay. So, I mean, the the Earth system responds fast relative to the mantle. So, um, the simu so the simulation gives us the begin state and the end state, and the lab experiments gives us the shape of the transient. Um, gives us information about that. Uh, <clears throat> so what happens is it basically we allow vol you know, volcanoes to erupt over time scales longer than 10,000 years, but less than about 100,000 years because of I'm trying to actually also keep track of the phosphate cycle to do the biology part right. Um, so we perturb the, the system, let the ocean chemistry respond to that, and then that's what sets the Henry's Law constant that determines the injection rate, if you will, of CO2 from the atmosphere into the upper ocean. So track alkalinity, track all kinds of stuff. Right, but what model are you actually using to do that? So we'd solve the carbonate system at every... So I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, you know, there's a bunch floating out there. Yeah, so... <clears throat> Yeah, but the answer is, I mean, I have to, I skipped that part, so hang on. I guess, 
how does the mantle temperature mm -hmm. get played into yeah, yeah. the CO2 output? Is that okay, so... Good question. Okay, so your question is basically where does that come from? And, and then what does the ocean do? And then what does the atmosphere do? Okay, <clears throat> so to get the rate of melting, so the, the Morb rate of melting, I use Mark Hirschman's solidus. So I say, okay, I'm going to use temperature differences that are constrained from Kellerman or Holbrook or less than that. And I take the, the heat flow and velocity constraints you use and say, okay, if I'm upwelling at those rates with this excess temperature, how much milk can I produce? And then I actually <clears throat> I look at it pretty carefully. So melting here, all the way through here, mid-ocean ridge melting is involving the upper mantle. During the transients, where you take lower mantle, you're taking mantle and overturning it, whether you use a wet solidus or dry solidus, it's probably a mix of the two. Um, it's the curve I'm showing here, I'm, I'm using a wet solid, uh, uh, an intermediate between his wettest solidus and his dry solidus on this side. So that's for the mid-ocean ridge basalt. The arc in the Pangean case has two parts. One is I'm just saying, okay, um, as I said very quickly at the beginning, uh, the arc flux is um, primarily related to whatever the average subduction rate is. So if the global average change in spreading rate is a factor of two, then I turn the arc downwelling, if you will, into a f up a factor of two. And assuming, I assume that the melt rate follows that. I've also, for the Pangean calculations, I've also added Sinti's, some of Sinti's arguments for metamorphic decarbonation, which only increases the result by 30% in terms of outgassing. So the mantle temperature, in principle, would set the viscosity and set everything. In reality, it's not a steady state problem. So the mantle temperature plus your constraints on heat flow and, and velocity set the change in velocity through this. Um, and so that's what sets the, the gas coming into the system. Now, in terms of what the ocean does, there's several things you have to worry about. So one is, do we have a constant alkalinity ocean? Yes, over a million year time scales. So as long as I look at long time scales, the problem stays pretty simple. So constant alkalinity, which allows the pH to do whatever it does. Um, and then I solve the full carbonate system to get the alkalinity in the upper ocean. Uh, <clears throat> And to get the Henry's well, to get a Henry's law constant that gives me a PCO2 drawdown at every step, and that's what gives me how much CO2 is left in the atmosphere. Um, on top of that, to get the chemical weathering that's going into um, the temperature model, uh, so this that time lag. Uh, I mean, it's comparable to observations, but it comes out of the experiments and the numerics. The magnitude I just take from integrating over the top of, just looking at the, the, the total amount of new basalt erupted over that Pangean uh, lip intensive time versus the background. Um, you can change, I mean, you can change this. So this is, you know, even here, we can increase it or reduce it by a factor of two. It doesn't change the trend. It's still a warm world. It's very hard to kill the greenhouse. It's very hard to kill the post-Pangean breakup greenhouse. Does that make sense? I can... Yeah, so I guess there's, there's one geodynamic part and there's one geological part. Yes. So you have two sort of things to and then oceanography and atmospheric chemistry. So the radiation model also, inclu also assumes that the Pangean atmosphere, the, the basic globally averaged water vapor, CO2, so nitrogen pressures assume to be the same everywhere. But the globally average CO2 and water vapors about what we get when you, when you put a profile through, NCAR, through, through NCAR's best model. Um, yes. But you asked for everything, so. Well, I guess we should probably break for dinner. Um, we start at 5.30. Everyone knows where to go in the faculty club. So for, you, for the students, by the way, um, almost everything I didn't talk about, someone's going to talk about here. So I'm hoping that I've laid out a few landmines that you can bring up later. <laughs>